All right, so um, we'll start off with the handout. Four Gospels are not chronological. I remember when I first started uh, really studying, I thought that as I was reading it from beginning to end in each one of the Gospels, that it was totally chronological. And uh, so when I got through with Matthew, I was pretty happy. I went into Mark, and I found out some things were not in the same order. I went to Luke and found out, yeah, again, some things were not in order. And some things were added, and some things weren't there. And then we get into the Gospel of John, and oh my, everything is uh, really different. So it, it is important that you just understand and know that they're not written chronologically. Now, if you look at Matthew, you can say, well, isn't it kind of chronological? Because it starts with his birth and ends with his... Um, his being received in back into heaven uh, isn't that kind of a chronological order and yeah it is uh, but many of the things that happened in there are not necessarily chronological also the synoptic gospels uh, basically discuss all the same events uh, however each one of those is different uh, as we're going to see tonight there are some things that are in Matthew that are not in any of the other gospels and there are some things in the other gospels that are not in Matthew each gospel is written to a different, um, a different audience by a different author. It's also important to note that the gospel of Matthew uh, is written by one of Jesus' apostles. So the parallel accounts that happen within the gospels, as we discussed last week, it's really imperative that you look at the whole gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you roll them together as one book and you then, uh, that would give you then the gospel of Jesus Christ. Each one of these men are looking at um, a different reason, a different audience, a different time period. And it's important for us to look at that and understand that God has a message for us in each one of these. But the total message is the birth, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and that Jesus is coming again. That's the real crux of the Gospels. And then there's all the material that's in between all of those uh, passages, uh, each one of these books, to ensure that we understand how Jesus came, how his life was while he was on this earth, what his ministry was like, what his death was like, what his uh, burial was like, what his resurrection was like, and that he's coming again. Those are really, really important. So therefore, if we look at the Gospel of Matthew, uh, maybe the question would be asked, and I started to ask this question, and, and I think in the future I'm going to start asking some questions and sending those out to you. But the question could be asked, why is the Gospel of Matthew the first book in the New Testament canon? Now, you're going to hear me use canon a lot. I've used it in the past. Uh, I've given you a really good definition of canon down at the bottom of your page there. Uh, the canon is basically taken from a Greek word mean, uh, called canon. Uh, and what it means is read or measurement. I think that's an interesting thing. So the canon of scripture is a book then or, or books that when they are placed next to God, then they line up as being uh, really spoken by God and are, 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 are referenced by the Holy Spirit to the writer to let them know what they should write. Uh, biblical canon or the canon of scripture is defined as a collection of texts, if you will, or books that are regarded as authoritative scripture uh, by both the Jewish writers, because the canon of the Old Testament, or the Christians, the canon of the New Testament uh, communities. And so therefore, these texts are considered in the Word of God. And together then, the Old Testament and New Testament canon, they create this one book we call Bible. And uh, so, therefore, whenever you mention Bible, uh, it normally means a collection of books, normally uh, books that we would consider as being holy. However, if you go to any kind of library, you're going to find a Bible about everything. I uh, look, there's an electrician's Bible, and there's an on and on it goes. Uh, everybody's got one. And the reason they, they use Bible is because it's a collection of items together that when they are viewed together, it, is, it comes out as a nice, great whole. W-H-O-L-E, not H-O-L-E. So what is the date? Well, this is kind of interesting. I've given you four points here. I think four. Let me see here. Four, five. I've given you five points that we need to consider. Now, when I was taking history in, uh, in grade school, and then I took uh, history in junior high, and then I took history in high school, I'm so thankful I didn't have to take history anymore. Uh, a simple fact that 
uh, my history courses were nothing more than knowing a name and knowing dates and uh, so therefore I, I knew that information but I didn't know it I, I, I knew what the response was supposed to be uh, but I didn't know about those things so I'm going to use dates because dates really help us to prove that scripture really is the authoritative word of God and that we can trust it so number one it's clear that this book was written before 100 AD uh, as Ignatius uh, he quotes from it Ignatius was a theologian and a church leader and uh, so he quoted it he was early first century uh, Matthew does not mention the destruction of Jerusalem or the temple uh, in any of his writings uh, and remember that took place in 70 AD now I was reading a, a commentary today and he made reference that this uh, book was definitely written after 70 AD because there's one verse in there where Jesus is quoting and he's talking about that there will be great destruction however I think that's really stretching it uh, I, I, I don't buy that very much at all uh, the third point is Matthew references uh, offerings in the temple, the temple tax, the temple worship, the ritual, and all that would lead us to believe that it is pre-70 AD. And I could ask the question, why would I think that? And I think I just answered that, because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So why in the world would Matthew be writing about those things, which they could no longer do, no longer participate, the temple was not there, the offerings could not be offered, so therefore... Uh, that also gives me great hope that this book was written before AD 70. Uh, Matthew's Gospel is filled with a lot of Jewish flavor, leading uh, the reader that the ending of the Jewish worship at the temple was still going on. So, uh, it, as a matter of fact, as we look at Jesus' last days, remember he goes to the temple on several occasions. Uh, he cleans out the money changers in uh, one time. Uh, and, and on and on. So he is he is currently going to the temple, uh, and so uh, you would say that his writings would include that period of time. But he does not say, oh no, by the way, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the, the Romans. He, he, he doesn't mention that. And then finally, uh, I say I think we can believe, or at least I personally believe, that we can date the writing of Matthew somewhere between 58 and 65 A.D as those dates best fill within the writings and the history of the times that Matthew is writing. Uh, one, other, one other point here as we're mentioning this, if Jesus died around 33 to 35 AD, you can see that there's 20 some years or even 30 years that this was written after the death of Christ. Now the question would rise, why in the world did it take them so long? Well you had to take that up with the Holy Spirit. Because uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who came upon these men and asked them to write. Perhaps they needed uh, more. Uh, they needed more experience in trusting in God. Maybe, perhaps, they uh, just needed a new flavor, if you will, of what life is really like. So that when they write it, it's not just about what they're currently going through, but the reasons that they're going through it. And of course, Matthew, uh, he's really writing to the persecuted church here. He's he's getting ready for us to do that. So in this study, we're not going to delve into one particular area, and I started to open this envelope and this can of worms, if you will, and talk about whether Matthew uh, really leans heavily on the Gospel of Mark, or he doesn't. Uh, there are those theologians who believe that the Gospel of Mark is the very first one. Personally, I believe it was. Um, and that uh, Mark, I mean that uh, Matthew and Luke then borrowed heavily from his writings. Now. When I say borrowed heavily, obviously I'm talking about the Holy Spirit is repeating the same things that Mark did. And so he's writing, he's asking him to write about those particular instances, those particular events. However, he's going to give them a little freedom because when Matthew writes, he, he includes things that were not included in the others. And vice versa, by the way. So it's interesting that Matthew uh, does not quote himself. So, when you read through Matthew, you're not going to find any place where Matthew said, and Levi said. You're not going to find that. I, I find that really kind of interesting. Actually, there, there's not one quoted word uh, in Matthew from himself. So, Levi turned to Matthew, or referred to as Matthew, does not quote himself. And, and really, that's kind of like John, isn't it? 
John does not refer to himself in his gospel either, and even in his writings later, he does not include himself. So Matthew do also does not include himself as far as being quoted. So that gives us a little bit of an idea. I believe this the book was written somewhere between uh, 58 and 65 A.D. Could be as late as 69, as long as before 70, and the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. I think that's a pretty good number. Uh, so what are then, or what is the purpose and the content of the Gospel of Matthew? Since Matthew's Gospel is presenting that Jesus is the Messiah and the King of the Jews, it's important for us to understand that who we'd be writing to. Well, if he was writing that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is the King of the Jews, the Gentile world could care less. It's not even on their horizon. So it's very easy to say then since Matthew is writing in such a way to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the prophecies concerning the Messiah and that he is King of the Jews, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, uh, then it just makes sense then that his audience then are Jews. Now, Christians today, we really don't quite grasp this sometimes. I'm, I'm always amazed in Bible studies where as I'm receiving uh, or we're talking about uh, Bible study that people consistently try to put America in there. Well, no, America is not part of the Gospels. Uh, Jesus was writing um, uh, or Jesus was speaking and teaching and he was going to the lost sheep of Israel. Um, and we kind of, we kind of, we're, we get accepted. We're writing on the back, if you will, uh, all the Jewish history. Uh, we, we sometimes want to put ourselves above the Jews and we cannot do that. We are, we're writing on their back. Um, uh, with the understanding that Matthew's gospel really is about Jesus being the Messiah and that Jesus, um, uh, is the King of Kings and that his audience is to the Jews then there are some things that we could look at and kind of divide this book into five different portions. Now, uh, you can divide it a hundred ways. As a matter of fact, when I first wrote this, I included two or three outlines, and I just, I just blew those away. I just said, you know what, everybody's got a different outline. If I was to ask you to outline chapter number one of the book of Matthew, uh, you may have one or two items in chapter number one. Personally, I would only have one. Uh, that's a genealogy back to uh, Abraham. The next portion uh, in Matthew really is about Matthew's uh, uh, writes to us about the visit of the Magi uh, to Jerusalem and then ultimately to where Jesus is. Um, we, are, we know that uh, at, towards the end of his ministry, uh, his entry into Jerusalem is a big deal. And so therefore there's, there's time spent on that. Um, Jesus teaches that there's going to be judgment of the nations, not just the nation Israel, but there's going to be judgment of the nations. Um, and then finally, in common with the other Gospels, uh, the superscription of the statement on the cross. So Matthew uses more Old Testament quotations and allusions to the Old Testament than of the, any of the other writers. Now, that's important. If Matthew is going to be writing to Jews to show them that Jesus is the Messiah, he is the promised one, he fulfilled all prophecies in order to be able to do that, and that he is the king of the Jews, the only way then to show that or to prove that is to go back then to the Old Testament and then prove that. So Matthew spends a tremendous amount of time doing that. Um, as I look at the different uh, verses that we have uh, when we really talk about uh, Matthew and what he's doing. One of the common phrases was uh, that which was spoken the prophet might be fulfilled. I found variations of that in 13 different places in the book of Matthew. Uh, I've got to be honest, when, when I see it once uh, I take notice, but when I see it twice I, I start thinking, wow, okay there's a message to be delivered here. But when I see it 13 or 15 times um, there is definitely a message. So if I, once again, did not know at the outset that Jesus, I mean, that um, Matthew was writing about Jesus being the Messiah or the King of the Jews, 
uh, I certainly would start understanding that because he consistently went back and said that it was spoken by the prophet that it might be fulfilled. He uses this over and over. I've given you a list there uh, that you can go look those up. By the way, if you find any others, just uh, just go ahead and email me or just go ahead and put it in the comment section. I'll be glad to look those up. Um, another interesting thing about Matthew and his writing, uh, the Holy Spirit allows, gives him a lot of latitude because he really stresses the teaching of Christ. Um, there is many discourses. Now, uh, discourse is one of those highfalutin theological terms, and what it really means is long teaching. So when we talk about a discourse, we're talking about a long teaching. Um, anyhow, Matthew houses five of these, and these are long discourses. They're long teachings, uh, taking up chapters. Some of them even go from one chapter to the next, and they're important. So if you had a red letter Bible and you open it up to Matthew, every place that there's a red letter, that is supposedly the, the words of Christ. So you're going to find that there are some chapters that are just full of red, and that's because these are teachings where Jesus is, uh, is really quoting, and Matthew then is writing what he quoted. In um, addition to this, uh, Matthew uses a term that's a little bit the, the, the different than the other Gospels, and that is that he uses the term kingdom of heaven. Now, only Matthew uses that. The other Gospel writers use the kingdom of God. So... Um, heaven was an important thing for the Jews. Now, there are some Jews, as we've already learned, uh, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the afterlife, they didn't believe in miracles, they didn't believe in that kind of thing, but for most of the Jews, they believed in some sort of afterlife. Um, Abraham's bosom is what they would call it. I'm going to where Abraham is. So it would be Abraham's land, because that is the, he's the Jews, for the Jews, he is the father of Judaism. So that would be a place for them to go. So uh, his discourses on the kingdom of heaven would be very, very important. If you start, start, start talking about the kingdom of God, he's going to lose some people because they won't quite understand that. Um, their, their whole goal is to be with Abraham wherever he is. Uh, this book obviously serves as a gap uh, or a bridge, if you will, over the gap of, between the Old and New Testaments. We talked about that last week, I believe. Uh, it links together the prophecies about the Messiah and the fulfillment of those prophecies uh, by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Matthew often alludes to um, quotes of prophets and connects their words then uh, with a subject of particular importance when it comes to uh, who Jesus is. Uh, and I've included, wow, there's a lot there, I've included several passages that you can go take a look at. Um, it was first thought that Matthew's notes uh, I'm sorry, it was thought that Matthew's first notes in the Old Testament, which says he is coming, then presents his own message and says he is here. So uh, when we start open up the book, we see that it says, and these are the generations of Jesus. So uh, generations is a term for Genesis. Um, generations, Genesis, they basically the same words, and it is a beginning. So when Matthew writes, he says, this is the beginning of Jesus. Now, we know that Jesus was always, always there, but he's writing to him as the son of Abraham, the son of David. And so it's important for him then to make that connotation. He also says that, hey, all those prophecies concerning the Messiah, concerning uh, Israel and their king uh, is being fulfilled. And so he's writing not just that he's not only just coming, but he also writes then, that he is already here. Now, um, I added this section today, and I'm not quite sure it's in yours. Um, uh, sometimes I do that, and I'm sorry. But um, the church, of the four canonical uh, gospels, canonical being in canon, uh, gospels, only Matthew contains the word church, and then it's only there twice. Um, he, the Greek word that he uses is ecclesia, or ecclesia, uh, meaning a popular meeting, especially of a religious congregation. So, for example, could the Jews uh, meet at the ecclesia? Yes, the Jewish synagogue, that would be their meeting place. And so, therefore, that would be called an ecclesia. Uh, a ch Christian community, when they would meet together for dinner and then Bible study uh, as such, uh, then they would meet together as an ecclesia, or ecclesia, meaning that it is a community um, of members. And uh, so 
these saints then are he refers to them then as being assembly a church so only Matthew uh, contains that and I find that very very interesting I don't know why Mark didn't include it I don't know why that John didn't include it I don't know why Luke didn't include it however if I'm going to try to understand that Matthew is building a bridge between the Old Testament temple worship offerings and that type of thing uh, going into the New Testament and showing that Jesus is a fulfillment of that he is the King of Kings and he is the Messiah then I think there has to be a bridge also between Old Testament practice and New Testament practice and so therefore it just makes sense that he would use the word uh, an ecclesia which is a congregation of believers meeting together so anyhow I went ahead and included that now Matthew structures his writing in a way that connects the Old and New Testament Israel's story with the with the emerging church so uh, remember Jesus message was to the lost sheep of Israel so 99 percent of his message is written in that manner however he also gives us hope he gives us great hope uh, Matthew includes Matthew chapter 28 go ye therefore into all nations preaching teaching and baptizing in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit we get that out of Matthew now if Matthew was only writing to Jews he would not necessarily need to say that instead go ye therefore into all Judaism uh, no it's all nations so we get the idea here that there has to be some sort of connection also Matthew's gospel uh, was greatly used by the early church showing really truly what Jesus mission was it shows his mission his birth his uh, his life his death and his resurrection um, Jesus sacrifice would resonate well with Jews because they understand the sacrificial system uh, the when uh, when John the Baptist says behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world to a Jew he would understand what that means here is a lamb that was selected then I'm going to place my hand upon that lamb that lamb's blood is going to be shed and my sins are pushed forward they're not forgiven but they're pushed forward so they would understand this term then that behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world that would resonate with them also if he's going to be showing that Jesus is the Messiah then he has to go through and show that Jesus truly is the anointed one because that's where Messiah comes from the anointed one the king of Israel uh, they would understand the importance of the assembly for the congregation of believers and Jesus was just as important uh, to these new foundling churches that would be receiving this word as to those Jewish congregations those Jewish readers those Jewish hearers that would hear his message it would be important to them and resonate with them as well important so therefore uh, the church mentioned in Matthew Matthew only as far as the Gospels go uh, was an important tie-in with Old Testament uh, religion to the New Testament religion nice tie-in between those two uh, I mentioned before a little bit about discourses and so I, I want to kind of give you an idea about that it's a, it's a highfalutin theological term um, when you get into seminary we use it all the time um, you'll hear me use the term every now and then uh, but a discourse technically it's some sort of formal communication of uh, thought uh, either written or spoken um, it can be a communication or even a debate so you could say if there was a debate going on between two folks uh, you could almost say that that was a discourse it's uh, it's a formal communication it's a formal idea you, you, you don't just sit around the corner and have a debate you have a debate in front of others and peers and they will decide who is the winner well that's kind of like what a discourse is theologically though uh, as far as the Christian church goes uh, it's a discourse is a large block of teaching by Jesus himself uh, there are five major discourses that are recorded for us in the book of Matthew and they all begin and end in a similar fashion uh, there's a general pattern to each block of teaching for example um, when you look at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount that's Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 it says um, and seeing the multitudes he went up into a mountain and when he was set his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying so the introduction is always basically the same something has happened and because of that Jesus either sits, sits or teaches from a boat or wherever it may be and he teaches and when he does it's because there's a response from folks around him so he gives this 
great teaching. Now, this is not to be uh, misunderstood according to the teaching that Jesus would give his uh, disciples. Uh, we don't have long blocks of that recorded anywhere. Um, when we get into his specific teaching, so many times it's the disciples didn't understand that's recorded that they come to Jesus, Jesus responds to them. Well, that's a quick, short thing. But when you look at the very first discourse, for example, in Matthew, is the Sermon on the Mount. Wow, that goes for chapter 5, chapter 6, and part, mostly, of chapter 7. So that is a long teaching. That is a discourse. Later, in the upper room, right before Jesus is going to be arrested, uh, Jesus teaches a long period about, if you will, what's going to happen in the end times. This is a discourse. It's over several chapters. So, again, it's a long teaching. So I hope that when somebody mentions the term discourse in the future, you'll be able to say, oh, I don't know what you're saying. It's a long teaching. Um, so the Sermon on the Mount, uh, much like the opening, uh, the Sermon on the Mount says, And it came to pass when Jesus ended these sayings, that people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as a scribe. So if you'll look at each one of the discourses, there is things that happen, then there's a discourse. And at the end of the discourse, the people go their way and they start thinking about what in the world he has to say. Uh, before I was a pastor, I remember I would go to uh, Sunday morning service, and I was always one to take notes. Uh, I don't know if God was just preparing me, but uh, I would take notes. And uh, so as the pastor was uh, preaching, teaching, then I would be making notes of what he said. And at the end of that, then I would uh, think about that for some time. Uh, and the reason I took notes is for later, I would come across those and I'd go back and I'd dig into it again and, and relive, not necessarily the sermon, but I'd relive that particular passage um, again. That is helping me to understand that. But in the discourses, you're going to find an entrance into the discourse, much like Matthew chapter number 5, verses 1 and 2, and also a exit from the discourse, and that is Matthew chapter number tw uh, 7, verses 28 and 29. So there's an entrance and an exit, and then there's the discourse there. And something happened to bring the discourse to bear, and something happens after the discourse that now all of a sudden they're going to think about it, they're going to act upon it, and that's what we see. Each one of them begins and ends in the same, uh, same type of pattern. I've just shown you that. Wow, did I have that in twice? Sorry about that. Um, let's go to the next paragraph down, generally speaking. Uh, I've I got to be honest, uh, my uh, word here does not like generally speaking. It doesn't like that. It would like me to use something else. But I'm just telling you, generally speaking, Matthew then chronicles the accounts of Jesus' ministry and then follows that with a discourse. So he talks about healings, he talks about um, uh, miracles, and then there's a discourse. He talks about ministry, some of the things he did, throwing, uh, throwing out demons out of people, uh, he, uh, people touching him and getting healed, him spitting in the clay and pe blind people can see, discourse. Uh, the Upper Room uh, Discourse, uh, which sometimes called the Olivet Discourse, uh, those are important because they teach about what's going to happen in the future. So Jesus' teaching of them, every audience included his apostles. So they got, they got it really firsthand sitting there. You almost wonder if they didn't get the VIP seats, the closest ones in, or maybe some of them allowed everybody else to get in. I don't know. But for us, there are five discourses. There's the Sermon on the Mount, there's the Commission of the Twelve, there's the Parables of the Kingdom, uh, uh, then there's the Meaning of the Greatness of, uh, and Forgiveness of God, and then the Olivet Discourse. Now, for others, they've renamed these, and I, and I kind of like some of these renaming. Um, there's the Sermon on the Mount, that's pretty simple. Then there's the Missionary Discourse. Now, this is when Jesus sends out the Twelve on their mission to Israel. Now, remember that. It's always important. They didn't just go out for everybody. They went to the lost sheep of Israel. And that's found in the 10th chapter, that whole 10th chapter. So if you have a red letter Bible, you get to the 10th chapter. It is just full of red. Um, then you have the parabolic discourse. Now, that's just a fancy word to say in the parables. So uh, Jesus taught in parables about the kingdom of God. And there's one whole chapter, chapter 13, where Jesus just bang, bang, bang. There's these parable after parable after parable. And they're all about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And so, therefore, it's important for you to know that. 
that when you get into this particular thing, Jesus uses a lot of variety talking about the same thing. He uses a parable, but it's really talking about the kingdom of heaven. He uses another parable, it's really talking about the kingdom of heaven. There's another parable talking about the kingdom of heaven. So anyhow, look that up. It's a great chapter. One of these days, uh, maybe in a future Bible study, we'll just look at all the parables of Jesus uh, because they're fascinating and uh, very exciting to look at. Uh, then there's the discourse on the church, if you will. Uh, Jesus teaches about the life in the community of the saints. So therefore, I like it that Jesus didn't just leave us alone and, and, fig and let us figure out how we're supposed to act. Instead, he tells us how we're supposed to act. And that's all found in the 18th chapter, verses 30, uh, 1 through 35. And then the final discourse is the discourse on the end times. And it's, it's always interesting to me how much interest there is Interesting to me how much interest there is. I don't know. I have to think about that in a minute. But it's always interesting to me how much interest is on the end times. Uh, people want to know what's going to happen uh, at the end. And I think it's all encapsulated. And it was for me as well, by the way. I, I just wanted to know. Uh, but it finally got encapsulated to me in a very simple way. And simply when Jesus said, hey, I, I don't know. Only the Father knows. And that hit me one day. Maybe I'm not supposed to know. Maybe, maybe I should know the generalities of it. Um, at the men's breakfast on Tuesday morning, uh, we had a prayer meeting, and then sometimes we go eat breakfast. Anyhow, at the breakfast, um, one of the things I said was how bad the world is today. It was just shocking. We had a prayer over, over how bad the world is today. And uh, I made a loose comment. I wonder how bad it was in the days of Noah. Uh, because God said, that's enough. Let's just destroy the world. And uh, we know the response of that. So if the world is so bad um, today, um, it must, must be going to get worse because the end times are coming. And Jesus wanted to make sure that they understood about the end times. They, they had questions. I mean, after all, they had given everything to follow him. So therefore, this discourse about the end times was very important to them. I can almost imagine, this is a long discourse, by the way. Uh, you'll see it's chapter 20, uh, 24 through almost chapter 25. Long, long discourse. Um, but if you read the Revelation and if you read Daniel and read Ezekiel, but you don't pick up this discourse about the end times, uh, you're going to be missing an important piece when we talk about the end times because Jesus identifies it for the, the, the apostles. He lets them know. So Matthew contains these very long, very detailed messages, sermons, if you will, teachings, um, and they're only in the book of Matthew. So remember, Matthew's gospel was written to the Jews to show that Jesus was a Messiah. It makes sense then that these, dis, uh, these discourses uh, would relate to Jesus being the king and we as his subjects. I mean, after all, that would be the important part. Uh, Jesus wasn't just teaching uh, about him being the servant. He also said that he was the son of God. And as such, we're to worship him. And if we're going to worship him, that means we should be subjection, subjected to him. And if he is the king of kings, then we are in subjection to him. So Matthew's gospel not only makes sense uh, to those folks who are Jewish in showing that Jesus is the Messiah, but it also should make sense for you and I today that he being the Messiah, the anointed one of God, is a uh, prophecy that has been fulfilled and that one day... We will, we will see the fulfillment of the remaining of the prophecy, and that is Jesus Christ will set up his kingdom, and it will be an everlasting kingdom. Looking forward to that. Um, so looking at a, just a really down and, down and dirty outline, um, the dominant theme of the gospel uh, basically is simply this, that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is the King of Kings. So I borrowed this just one. And by the way, there were many of them I could have borrowed from, but... Uh, Walter Dunnett, in his book, Exploring the New Testament, he outlines Matthew like this. Uh, the introduction of the king. Then, he's, uh, then he lists here the demands of the king, and then the deeds of the king, the programs of the king, the destiny of the king, the problems of the, uh, of the king, the death and resurrection of the king, and the final commission by the king. And the reason I threw that in there is so that we really understand Matthew is written to show us that Jesus is the Messiah, but he's also the king of kings. And it's almost like um, as we're going through the book of Revelation, I consistently will remind you that the revelation is of Jesus Christ. It's not written specifically for end times. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. 
So when we look at Matthew then, and if we're going to consider that he is the king of kings, then maybe the outline should show it. So anyhow, that's the reason I went ahead and included that. I uh, hope, you'll, hope you'll like that one. Uh, so what are some of the theological themes that we have um, in, in Matthew? Well, first off, Jesus fulfilled all the activities the Lord himself has prescribed and predi uh, predicted by the Old Testament. Jesus is the prophesied Messiah. I'm giving you verses there. Jesus is the servant of the Lord. I'm giving you verses there. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And for some reason, I didn't write that down. I am sorry. But that you can look that up. Um, the kingdom of heaven is listed 116 times. Now, that's a lot of times. Remember, I said if something's mission, mentioned twice, we ought to take notice. Well, if it's in there 116 times, God may have a reason for us to understand the importance, then, of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we learn about God. It's God's purpose that Jesus came. Jesus says, I have come to fulfill the will of my Father. So, therefore, Jesus' coming is in fulfillment of God's demands of him, if you will, his edict that he come and uh, become the offering for all mankind. It also gives us a good idea of the who is Christ. Matthew centers on the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, everything about it is Matthew is the main player, if you will, the main character in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we learn that he is the son of David, he is the son of Abraham, he is the son of God, he is the son of man. Uh, all those things then we learn and they are theological themes that are intertwined through all then of the Gospel of Matthew. So you can't take a page and not have one of those themes interwoven in what he's saying, particularly in the discourses. So um, I threw this in here just for you guys. Uh, what are the parables that are only in the Gospel of Matthew? And so there's the parable of the wheat and tares, the hidden treasure, the pearl, the net. And anyhow, you can read that list. Those are only in Matthew. So the question I would ask, if we were all together, is why did, was, were, were these only mentioned by Matthew and not by the others? Because he's talking to Jews about who Jesus is. So if I'm going to try to get the Jews to understand that there is a penalty, if I don't accept Jesus as their Messiah, the Son of God, then the parable of the wheat and tares is a good one. Uh, those who don't believe in, in God and uh, Jesus will be burned up. Um, there's a hidden treasure. The Jews did not pick up that Jesus was the Son of God. Instead, they crucified him. Uh, the parable of the pearl and net, and you can just look at all those. The parable of the talents, all those things you can look at. Um, so anyhow, those are included then only in the book of Matthew. I want to thank you so much for being with us tonight. And... Uh, Thank you, and if these are if you're finding these are welcome to you, um, invite somebody to to come and participate. Uh, all they got to do is just join 7320.com, and they can download the the information. So you know it's it's free. I'm not charging anything for this. And uh, but anyhow, if you're if you're enjoying this, and you find somebody that mentions it, um, just go ahead and, and invite them to come. Uh, that would be really wonderful. Okay, well, let's uh, close tonight with a word of prayer. Thank you.